Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar of Depth of Field 2023. I'm David Brommer, your MC and host for the day. I'm joined by Michael Hollander, another B&H guy who's an amazing photographer and is also the host of the exposure stage when Depth of Field uh, occurs next week. I think we're only, what, Michael, like 12 days away now or Just something? Just about. That's right. And we're excited. I'm very excited. I, I I woke up to a to a uh, to an anxious nightmare this morning that something was wrong with the schedule, but uh, no, indeed, uh, everything is is really great. We have a big announcement to make. Uh, we were holding a space open for a final speaker, who's someone who's incredibly busy, uh, especially this time of year, and is really hard to pen down. And we finally we got him. Uh, so our special speaker, if we can have a drum roll. Mike, you got a drum roll for me? Let's do it. Brrr. It is Mark Seliger. Yes, Mark Seliger is the uh, famous portrait photographer, one of uh, really one of the greatest uh, living American photographers right now. And uh, he has done uh, Depth of Field 2021. We interviewed him, uh, but he's actually going to be coming and joining us live on the second day of Depth of Field. That's Wednesday, February 8th from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Well, Mark Seliger is going to be discussing uh, an interesting brand of his work. He has a music band, a country band called Rusty Truck, and uh, he's going to be uh, unveiling a, a new video and an album that they just did. But the video is significant. It has dance by Twyla Tharp. It's got Katie Holmes, Cheryl Crow. It's a. It's really a. a he's worked with some amazing people to put this together. He's going to talk about that uh, experience of shooting a video. So this should be really cool. Really excited for that. Uh, before we get on to today's webinar, a couple more house cleaning things I have for everybody. Um, if you have a Fuji camera, a Sony camera, a Canon camera, or a Nikon camera, you can bring two bodies and two lenses to depth of field at the New Yorker Hotel on 27 and 28, and you can get a free clean and checkup where they'll take your cameras and do a good cleaning and give it a checkup and make sure it's all good. If there's any problems, they'll alert you to that. But uh, that's good because a lot of our cameras got a little dusty. Great way to start off the new year with a clean camera. Uh, you'll get some details from uh, an email that will come for that shortly. And also want to let everyone know that another cool thing is that the Depth of Field Challenge. The challenge is going to be digital this year. You're going to be making photographs at Depth of Field. You're going to be submitting them to Depth of Field and you're going to be winning big in some categories. We're going to go over that for you in an email coming up very soon. But you heard it first here about Mark Seliger, big announcement. Nobody knows about that. So pretty amazing stuff. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michael now and uh, hope everyone enjoys this webinar. And there will be time for Q&A at the end and also during it. So drop your questions into the YouTube chat and perhaps we'll be able to ask the amazing Chris, these questions. Thanks. Yes, very good. Thank you, David. Super excited. We are kicking things off with our first webinar for Depth of Field. Uh, Chris Orwig is a commercial editorial photographer, best-selling author, a teacher, and a Sony artisan of imagery. He's worked for brands including SpaceX, Google, Facebook, Patagonia, The Nature Conservancy, many, many, many more. The thread which connects Chris's work is his clear passion for authenticity. Um, he deeply, deeply cares about empowering others to create their best work and really live their best life. He's a regular speaker. He's been with us before. Um, he's been at conferences like the Photo Creators, WPPI, Adobe Max, and a ton and ton of others. And you'll see him at the next one. And without further ado, let's kick off Depth of Field with our first webinar. Welcome, Chris Orwig. Hey, Michael, thanks so much. I really appreciate that. So good to see you and see David as well. And um, I love Depth of Field. And so it's really fun to get to kick things off a little bit and get some momentum going here and talk about portraiture. Also super excited about that um, mention of Mark Seliger. I've had the chance to spend some time with him and he is a phenomenal person. So you won't wanna miss that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into my slides and start off with just showing you some photographs and then get to my topics. But I want to start with some photos just so you have a little bit of context of who I am and where I am coming from. If we haven't ever met before, it's wonderful to meet you. And thank you so much for for joining us and joining me today and welcome. And I like to shoot photographs which really show some sort of connection, whether it's a friend or maybe a celebrity or a stranger. And I'm always interested in exploring how we can capture something which gets to a little bit of the essence of who someone is. 
sometimes that means like in this case, I just had met those people. They were strangers. Other times it's with a friend and still other times um, it's with someone that I know. And I included this slide on the left, Mark Seliger over there because I just heard he was he was speaking a few minutes ago. So I, I snuck that one in or Millie Bobby Brown, uh, actress on the right. And I like to think of portraiture in really broad terms. We can even capture a portrait of a wolf. Sometimes I do my work on studio sets um, during filming. Sometimes I work in the studio. And so whatever type of portraiture you do, I'm hoping that what I'll share today will be relevant as you explore how to tell the stories of your subjects, how you do that outdoors, indoors, you know, kind of more journalistically, more intentionally, whatever it is. Um, I want to share with you some tips that I think are essentials and that can really help you elevate your game, whether you're shooting from the water like I was in this case, or this is in Brooklyn on the streets in a parking lot, um, who knows where. I like to photograph kind of anyone, anywhere, any place in the world. I'm also an author. This is my most recent book called Authentic Portraits. And as mentioned, I'm a Sony artisan of imagery, which is a huge honor. There are a number of us, um, too many to include on this little slide, but some really great friends and fellow photographers. So real honor to be part of that. And what I'm going to share today, it started off as 25 tips. That's kind of what I pitched. And I realized if in order to share 25 tips, it would almost I'd have to go so shallow that it wouldn't be as valuable. So I'm going to I'm going to start with 10 big ones and then conversationally we can hit some of the others. And the gear that with the images you've seen and you will be seeing the gear that I use most frequently, almost 90% of the time is the Sony A7R5, the A1, and then the trio of those lenses. I'm not going to talk about gear really at all throughout the rest of this talk, but I wanted to give you a little bit of context of where I'm coming from with the gear that I'm using. That 24 to 70, 85 and 50 are my go-to lenses and then those two cameras, R5 and the A1. All right, so what are the 10 tips for better portraits? And the first one is that portraiture is a process. And what I mean by that is that when we see these great photographs, and let, I'm gonna even go to Mark Seliger. I once had Mark visit me in my office here in Santa Barbara, and we were looking at some of his photos from a recent photo shoot, and it was of an A-list celebrity, and the first photos weren't very good. And it was such a relief to see that because I saw that even someone like Mark Seliger has a process. And what that means is that we go through these steps and that helps us arrive at the final image. And very rarely, at least for me, do I get it straight out of the camera? Nothing really comes easy for me in portraiture. Rather, it's this process. And I think if we can start to embrace that, we can be a little bit easier on ourselves when we get the first photograph like this one here. This is another Sony artisan, Ben Moon, where you, you know I, I shot it holding the reflector because I wanted to remember that, but the brick wall in the background, it just was too much brick. It was, it was kind of too distracting, but then what I did, maybe let me jump backwards, is I had him step away from the wall, still didn't like the bricks, step over two feet in front of a wooden door, still didn't like that. Then I had him step into the doorway. And once he got into the doorway, that helps create the shadows along the cheeks because he, the subtractive light from being inside of the doorway just a little bit. And there happened to be a piece of foam core there. And so he's just balancing that against his back. But the whole idea is that even just, this was at an event, we were just hanging out. It was maybe a two minute process, but that process is really, really important. And if we can start to lean into that, whether we're photographing friends or in this case, a family with a family all clumped up on the beach, we're on the left and then on the right, they're much more organized. And so every time I'm shooting, I'm always thinking, okay, if I get the shot that doesn't really work of my daughter on the left, I say, okay, that's fine. Just let that be what it is and kind of give that space because let's say with kids, they need to goof around or with some subjects, they just need to feel awkward. And our goal is to take them through that process um, to get them there. This was from a number of years back at um, Photo Plus, and this was just in the lobby, photographed this guy and then had him stand in front of this wall. And so again, there's that process. So that's tip number one. Tip number two connects to that. And it's this idea that portraiture isn't easy. I think when we see good photos, they have the sense of like, that wasn't very hard. I mean, it just looks like everything's all aligned and perfect and beautiful and wonderful or whatever it is. 
But the reality is that I think portraiture is one of the most difficult types of photography. There's so many variables. We have the camera work we have to think about, light lens composition, the subject, the look, their likeness, connecting them, directing them, posing. We have to tell some kind of a story. Is it a simple story? Is it a subtle story? Is it profound? Is it intriguing? And then we have all of our own internal self stuff. We have insecurity. We have to be aware of multiple things um, and then the location as well. And so with all of that, with all of those challenges kind of stacked up against us, knowing that this is a process, I think the one which sometimes kind of takes the cake for a lot of people is that, or that they ask a lot about is how do you photograph someone that isn't interested in being photographed or who says I'm not photogenic or you can just tell they're not really into it. And I would say 90% of the people I photograph fall into that category. And that's like this person here, this is my friend Beth and this is out on this ranch that she manages. It's a beautiful day um, just north of where I live, you know, great clouds, great everything. And you can tell, I think I have a zoomed in version of her facial expression. She is like, Chris, are you serious? Like I do not, she does not want me to take her portrait. And so part of that is just embracing that and saying, yeah, I mean, who does? And when she said, Chris, you know, I'm really not into this. I said, I get it. It's not very fun, but here, let me tell you my idea. Let me let me do the work of a photographer, which the work of a photographer, at least for me, is never the first shot. The first shot is almost like, just like this knee jerk reaction. You see something and you capture it, but that's not work. That's just a, a, a response. The work is like, okay, how do I then arrange myself, arrange my subject? She says, what do I do with my hands? I say, well, what if you hold your hat? What do I do with my feet? What if you just kick your feet across? Cause I needed to see both of them. What if we call up your dog who was, who was on the ground and then don't look at the camera. Cause she's like, oh, thank you. I don't want to look at the camera. Okay, look out at the sea. And then I'm also thinking about the horizon line and my camera height and my proximity to the subject. I want her shoulders. I like shoulders. You'll see this a lot in my photos that align a little bit with the horizon or the heads almost always above the horizon. So it's not super heroic, but slightly. So that's all the work stuff. That's all the process stuff. So the fact that she doesn't want to be photographed, let me jump back there, is irrelevant. I mean, it's actually, if she tells me, it's almost helpful because I say, oh yeah, I get it. Who does want to be photographed? Let's, let me get there and let's do this together and let's collaborate. In this situation, this is a world champion surfer, Kelly Slater. He did not want to do the photo stuff we had to do. He would rather throw this little thing for his dog. But again, you know, do the work of a photographer, make the connection, pay attention to the light, think about lens, think about location, think about how we're integrating into that. And the big thing here, the big takeaway maybe with this tip is that if your subjects are disinterested, like my subject on the last left over there, what tends to happen is we either get frustrated maybe with our subjects or we get a little disappointed and frustrated with ourselves like what am i going to do but what i'm encouraging you to do is to say well take that disinterest and say okay this is great raw material to work with because we can bring that somewhere we can figure out how to make that connection and of course the work of photography involves a lot of different things like posing like exposure my other image was underexposed on the left um, but part of that was my camera was just reading the exposure and the background was so bright but then once she got down in the shadow kind of leaned on one knee looked up a little bit i had beautiful light in the eyes increase my exposure a touch just by not notching that up with exposure compensation and then what i do a lot i'll have my subject take a breath and just be connected i'm talking to my subject and it gets somewhere right other times it's not disinterest it's like they're goofing around or maybe that's the cheesy grin like we have in this case that's fine i'm not i'm not worried about that because i know my job is to do the work of a photographer it's to go from point a you know to point whatever to you know to, to get somewhere so this is different than let's say architecture photography architecture photography you start off with a beautiful building or home or food photography the food is already styled and wonderful but in portraiture, very rarely are we starting at a place which is epic and heroic and wonderful and perfect. And so what we need to do is honor that process and, and lean into this fact that there are obstacles and that we can overcome those. And the biggest one is that the subject isn't really into it. This leads to number three. And for number three, 
Um, and maybe I should pause right here too, um, just to give a shout out to my my folks here. If there are any questions or comments or reflections, or if my audio is okay, um, if I don't hear back anything, I can just keep going. But Michael, anything from you or anyone else, or should I just keep jamming jamming along here? Keep on jamming, all good. Great. So this leads up to this whole thing that portraiture is worthwhile because there are so many obstacles and because it is so difficult, sometimes we can think like, okay, is this really worth it to take a photo of my mom or my dad or this person I admire and put all this effort into it? Or let's say in this case, someone I just met didn't even know. And you can tell she's just so <laughs> utterly disinterested. Is, is it worthwhile to put in the effort? And the answer is always, almost always yes because it's a chance to create a meaningful connection with someone to truly see someone to encourage them to create a moment and also to create a gift um, i think portrait in many ways is a service um, and we're giving something to people and to the world and so if i jump back for a second you know from here i'm a little bit too close um my white balance setting i didn't like so i changed that that afforded me to have that those cool and warm tones so this is all kind of in camera and then rather than both of her hands on her head, I said, hey, what if you what if you lean on the railing? And this is a posing technique I refer to as anchoring that gave her an anchor point. It created nice flow and shape in her body. And then I also had to get a little bit lower, a little bit further back. And so is it worthwhile? Totally. This guy's just being a total goofball. But I know that there's an opportunity for something which is soulful and deep and meaningful. In this case, this is a bride. This is up at Glacier Point in Yosemite. This is a, a deep, dear family friend. And this is, I don't know, maybe one of the worst wedding or bride photos I've taken. It just looks like she's in a parking lot or something, not at Yosemite. But that's okay. In this case, it, she's interested in the photos, but I'm just, I was so excited to be there that I just took the picture, right? And I think a lot of us do that as photographers. We just were like, oh my gosh, this is the moment. But then we have to say, okay, do the work of a photographer and pay attention to the scene. And this is just, you know, maybe 15 feet away from that other shot. And it's arranging her, it's arranging myself, it's thinking about the narrative. I'll deconstruct this one a little bit later. But the whole point of it is that this is so worthwhile. It's worthwhile, I'm rewinding a little bit to think about it's a process. Okay, yeah. There are lots of obstacles, but we can overcome those by really dropping into doing doing the work. And all of that leads up to right now, this tip that this is worthwhile. Okay, tip number four, here we go. The trick with all of this is that there are many, many different ways to capture portraits. And there are so many different portrait photographers that I admire and almost every one of them has a different way to work. They have a unique, path that they use to get there and the unique variables that they like to combine to tell stories you know it's almost like many there are many writers but everyone's writing is a little bit different and it's the same thing with with portraiture so in this case i'm walking around with alana here and we're going through this parking lot and i'm so excited about capturing her portrait it's obviously really bad but i'm i'm getting somewhere and what I'm, I'm here in this parking lot because there's a white building. I'm, I live in Santa Barbara, a coastal town in California. So we have a lot of Spanish architecture, a lot of white stucco type buildings. So I have one white building next to another. So I have great reflecting light. I'm in, I'm in open shade. So there's just a building blocking the sun. It's probably about noon. In this case, I'm shooting the Sony a7R4 and the 85G master lens. And what I know is there's potential for an image here, and I have to figure out my path of getting there. And Alana was not interested at all in this moment. She's like, we're in this parking lot. <laughs> what are we doing? And so I need to kind of tell her a little bit about what I'm thinking and then ask her about her life. She's from Russia. What was it like growing up there? You know, just talk to her, just ask meaningful questions, listen deeply. And then after making that connection, then I can direct and say, hey, what if you stand right here? And oh my gosh, that looks really good. Now take a breath and now let me capture the portrait in that moment. And so the path that I take to get there is very conversational. Um, it My direction, and in this case, my posing, it's a posing technique, which I refer to as eye to eye. And I'll talk a little bit more about posing later, but it's a very natural, simple technique. Um, shoulders really matter. Um, any tension if they have it or they don't really matter so anyway my path to get there 
affords me and allows me to capture a photograph like this just randomly walking around. Um, and I love that. And I love that kind of path. Now, other people really like to be in the studio and capture in the studio and have a different path. But the point of this is that what we need to do as photographers is get really, really clear on how we want to get there and what we're aiming for. And so one of the ways I think we can do this is by beginning with this big picture. And I'm going to walk you through a few slides with some copy and some images. If you're taking notes, this would be a good time to get out a piece of paper and a pen and, and just even write to yourself, okay, begin with the big picture and then get specific. And let me deconstruct what I mean by that. So big picture, there are so many ways to do portraits. We could do headshots, we could do lifestyle images, high school seniors, events, nonprofit work, celebrities, environmental. It could be different kind of subjects we're photographing, actors, poets, uh, family portraits. It could be more conceptual, more candid. You get the idea. So this is something where I would just start to jot down in really big, big, big picture. What are some of the things that interest you as a portrait photographer? What are some of the people that interest you? And this is kind of like saying, hey, I want to go on a trip. And, I'm, and I say, okay, where? And this is almost like saying, I want to go to the West Coast. And I say, okay, what do you, you mean like Oregon, Washington, California? And you're like, I mean California. I say, okay, great. So that's starting to narrow us down a little bit. So the first step is to really think about who it is that you want to photograph. And so we start to to reduce and simplify in that way. And so I have lists that I create all the time so that the subject matter that I'm sort of pursuing and that I'm photographing kind of fit into this. And then I have that together and I start to think about, well, how is it that I wanna tell their story? There's so many different ways and so many different values. Maybe I wanna show their essence. Maybe I want images that are quiet and soulful. Maybe I want images that are kind or pensive or calm, or maybe you're someone who really likes stuff that's raw and edgy. That's fine too. The point is that you don't need to become like me, but you need to think about what you want to create. So in my case, let's say I'm photographing an actress and these are my adjectives. And so then when I'm there and I'm going through my process, I'm leaning into that and I'm actually know where I'm going versus just randomly like, well, I hope it turns out good. And I hope you can kind of stand like this. <laughs> Um, it's much more defined. And what I find is that by beginning with this big picture and then narrow it into getting specific, it can help us find our way. And so let me give you a few more examples with that. We need to get really clear on how we want to do photography. And this is kind of, you know, just for fun, but let's say there's the backpacker version, which is one camera and one lens. That's often me. I don't typically have assistants. I typically have very minimal gear and I like that. But then there's other photographers. It's more like they, if we compare photography to camping, if they go camping, they like the RV, you know, they want to have the, the TV there, the coffee machine, the, the, the generator, they want to have lenses and lots of gear and lots of assistance and lots of sets. And both of those are great ways to say, visit a national park, right? They're both valid. They're both wonderful. But what you have to do as a photographer is decide, well, what kind of photographer do I want to be? And what tends to happen sometimes is because the gear is so interesting is that we carry so much gear that it gets in the way of us actually capturing the image. And so what I found in my own process is that if I carry less, I can capture more. And so this is me. And again, you don't need to be like me, but you need to figure out, well, how do you want to get clear? with what you want to achieve. And then what is it that you want to achieve? What kind of art are you working towards? And I love that Bob Dylan quote that I have on the screen that the aim of art is to stop time. So when I'm going through my process and when I'm aiming my camera, when I'm thinking about all these things, I'm thinking about, yes, I want to try to create that something, that pause, that stillness that's there. So this really comes from this whole idea of getting super specific on what we're aiming for. And a lot of my photography students, they'll be really good, but they kind of almost shoot, shoot too much of too many things in too many different ways. And then therefore they don't have a style. But if you look at someone like Mark Seliger that we mentioned earlier, you see his images and you instantly know it's his. You don't have to see his name next to it. And that's because he's spent a lot of time getting really specific. So here's another way you might try to do this or access this. You could grab a couple of your photos like I have here and just start to think about different words and adjectives. In this case, it's a, another set of words. I do these exercises a lot, but in this case, you see kindness, connection, humanity, wisdom, stillness, 
honesty, honesty, duality, duality. What I mean is I like photos that are, um, maybe they're both beautiful and a little melancholy, or they're both, um, uh, quiet, but they have a strong voice. So, so I like that. So anyway, with these kind of words, they, they help me get somewhere with my images so that when I'm in a moment and the moment is beautiful and wonderful, and sometimes frankly, maybe a little bit overwhelming, because a lot of times when you're a photographer, you're just like, oh my gosh, there's so many things happening. How do I, how do I handle all of that? Those words help me get where I'm trying to go, getting specific, knowing like, I'm not just going on a trip to the West Coast. I'm actually going to a specific town in a specific state in a specific way that allows me to get there. Jumping to a different kind of photography, let's say family photography, just to show that this applies to, I think all genres of, of photography is in this case, I have words like beautiful and genuine and natural and warm and nostalgic and authentic and modern. And I'm just like brainstorming I'd words and ideas and say like, well, what out of those words really ring true? Okay, this is it. I want to capture family photographs that are beautiful, that are genuine, that are warm, that are heart heartfelt, that are authentic, that are kind. Because the trick with all of this and these kind of adjectives and this kind of vision is we, most of us have too many. And it's kind of like when you ask someone, um, hey, what kind of music do you like? And they say, well, I like, I just like everything. No one likes all kinds of music. And because there's plenty of music that I could play for you that you wouldn't like. And so what we have to do if we're going to enter into, say, the music industry, in our case, photography industry, is we have to get really specific with our taste because it's our taste, which will then refine our vision, which will also help us develop our style. So for example, one of the words you've seen on my list is honest. I want to create honest images. So if I'm photographing a famous baseball player, I'm not photographing him in an edgy way. I'm not photographing him in a heroic way. Those are not things I'm aiming for, but honesty, yeah. And I think those photos have some of it. Sometimes I like to create images that have a sense of poetry to them, or maybe are, are a hint of magic and they're magical. And in this case, I'm using post-production to help further that vision. So this is not how the image appeared straight out of the camera. It was more blue in the background, but I liked kind of thinking, okay, well, what if I were to do a poetic uh, kind of iteration on that? Or what if I want an image which has some truth and revelation? And what I mean by revelation is something that reveals reveals something, some kind of hidden truth that we couldn't access without the image. And so this is a self-portrait. Um, a good friend of mine, John, helped me capture this. He was the one who pushed the shutter release button, but it was kind of my idea and vision. So I don't know if it's technically a self-portrait, but either way, the idea with this image was I was writing a book called The Creative Fight, which was all about this idea how sometimes we just have to go for it. Like we have to immerse ourselves. And sometimes creativity is all flow and fun, and other times it's fight and it's hard. And so I wanted an image which revealed that truth, that idea. And I think this one does that. And, um, and it was hard to do. It was a fight to create the image. All right. So let me pause there. And we're going to jump to our fifth tip here. We're, we're about halfway through our tips and stuff. And just want to check in with my, my crew and everyone. Um, Michael, any, any questions coming in or anything that you have a question about or David or, or or I can just keep jamming too. Hey, you know, you're jamming along so good. We're getting questions and I'm noticing that you're actually answering those questions as they're okay. coming in. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think you got a lot to cover and let's cruise through and maybe we'll just, we'll just yes. sort through the best Q&A at the end. But Perfect. awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and it's nice to kind of catch our breath a little bit too, because I like to move quick as you can tell. And number five is about synchronization. Um, and in portraiture, what tends to happen is that we as photographers are completely disconnected from our subjects when it comes to our interests and our internal dialogue and our thoughts. And what I see is a lot of students that I work with and I mentor a lot of people and I do a lot of workshops and a lot of teaching is they don't quite realize this. So photographers, it's like all they're thinking about is photography and they see someone they're like oh my gosh oh my gosh that'd be an amazing subject or look at that or, look at this light look at this oh my gosh do i have that lens oh, is my lens clean do i have a fresh car do i have a fresh battery you know we're just like in camera mode right and our mind is just full of a thousand different photography related thoughts a subject on the other hand and it could be any subject and i i think 
photography or portraiture is the most inclusive genre of photography. And what I mean by that is it's about humanity. So literally any human is a good subject. So whoever it is we're photographing, they're thinking typically about something other than photography. Maybe in this case, um, the subject's thinking about, should I go to a yoga class tonight or should I go um, climbing at the gym, right? And so there's this disconnect. And what we do in our photographer's mind is we're excited about our new camera, our new lens or whatever. We maybe approach someone, whether it's a, a paid commercial shoot um, or it's uh, photographing a friend. And let me give some examples. Let's say I was photographing an astronaut who is going to fly into space. And I was so excited because I'm like, this is an astronaut. So I was thinking about the light and all this stuff. And I went to start doing the portrait shoot and I could tell he was really concerned about something else. And he was concerned about something that was potentially going to go wrong with, with this flight into space, which is kind of a big deal because, you know, you could die. And so I was like, I wasn't even sensitive to that, right? To what his concerns were. So I need to stop, let go of my concerns, start asking him some questions about his, and then I could create a meaningful portrait. So we ask these people, can I take your photo? And they're just like, whoa, they they like melt into this, this thing and think this sounds like the most horrible thing ever. Um, and and that's, that's a clue to us that we need to really pay attention to that we aren't synchronized. And the way that we get synchronized, I think, is to remember that we should never photograph a model, musician, athlete, astronaut, artist, surfer, CEO, whatever, but we should always photograph a complex human with interests, dreams, past, pain, joy, soul, heart, and mind, and so much more. And the way that we can get to that, I think, is through genuine conversation. We can ask about someone's interest. We can ask them even a simple question. I was recently photographing someone incredibly accomplished. I just said, how is your day going? And they said, you know, not very well. And it was so funny to hear that because we think, or I think, someone who's really accomplished and has everything doesn't have bad days. So I just assumed they were going to arrive at the shoot in a really upbeat way, but it wasn't the case, right? So we, we, we have this conversation. We ask some questions. Oh, you like the mountains. Well, are we talking what kind of mountains or, or what are your interests? Or you play the electric guitar. Well, do you like electric guitar with a lot of distortion or do you like more melodic or what, what is it that you like? Because ultimately, the best portraits that we capture, they're less about looks and they're more about soul. They're about essence or about who the person is. And so what we have to do as portrait photographers is kind of do this little switch. And we have to switch out of the sense where we're just thinking about photo stuff and about how something looks to about who someone is. Tip number six. Often subjects don't know what to do. So in this case, here's our baseball player friend. And with another guy, this is a guy who is a high school kid helping me out in the shoot. And it's like two guys standing near a van and it's, and this is the van he lives in in the off season and it's cool and it's a cool spot, but it's a really bad picture because they're just like standing there like, uh, what are we supposed to do? But what we have to do, do the work of a photographer is say like, hey, Daniel, what if you lean against the van? And then I have to arrange myself, get a little closer, find you know, a way where he kind of separation from those banana trees in the background and take a look at the difference kind of on the van and from here to that. And just he didn't know what to do. People don't know how to stand or pose. But if you say, hey, just what if you lean that an elbow on the van and then what if you look just look over that way. Cool. He can do that. He can accomplish that. In this case, we already talked about that. What if you lean on that railing? And then the rest of the pose just took completely care of itself, but it was just giving this small thing. Here is um, a friend of mine, Steven. He's a shoe designer. Amazing guy. He's just like walking out in the road. He almost looks like he's just lost. <laughs> he does no idea what he's doing. He's just sort of like, you know, shuffling around doing this like shuffle thing. Like, what do I, why am I here? And say, well, what if, what if you lean against the back of the car, you know, put your hands in the car, kick your feet across and then look, yeah, don't look over that side. Look over right over here. Okay, perfect. Right. So we need to give them these little mini instructions. What if you sit in the car like you're about to drive away and, and uh, then look back towards me? Here's that same person we saw earlier, Beth. You know, Rather than just stand there, what if you lean against the doorway? What if you lean against the wall? And these small little actions can have such a powerful impact on people. And giving people just small little achievable act, um, actions can be a great way to improve your portraits. In the subject, this is now in the studio on the left, I was photographing her partner and he's a famous podcaster. She was just there to hang out. And I said, can I capture a portrait of you as well? And she was like, oh, you don't want a picture of me. 
but I mean, look how stunning she is. And she's like, what do I do with my hands? And just say, well, what if you just hold, you know, this, this, I don't know what this kind of shirt, you know, so her hands are there. And I just, for some reason, wanted hands in the shot or in the one on the right. What if you lean onto this table and then lean onto your hand, just kind of a slight light lean onto your hand. Or sometimes the actions are a little bit bigger. I carried this little rock out into the water. I stood on it and said, what if you, you know, pull up your dress a little bit, wade out in the water. It's, it's not very deep, you know, maybe a foot deep and then stand on that rock and that gives the subject something to do and it helps you to tell their story this one is a, a artist in town and she's doing like the robot because when you ask when you point a camera at someone they do really funny things they do shuffles they do uh cheesy grins there's also the robots come on one where they're kind of like walking around like what am i supposed to do right now <laughs> And so what you do is you have a conversation and she says she loves roller skating. I said, well, do you have roller skates here? She's like, oh yeah, why don't you put them on? And then why don't we grab one of your paintings? And it's the same setting. It's the same everything. I did arrange myself a little bit. I had her come in front of the wall a little bit. Camera's height is a little bit lower. And then I also had her um, turn her face towards the window, which is off camera left because I wanted more light on her face. And it's a you know beautiful photograph, but it comes from not like, hey, pose by putting your hand on your hip, but by this small little action. So if you're if you're struggling with posing, one of the biggest, most important tips I think I could provide to you is to just ask your subject to do something that's a small action which is achievable. Okay, tip number seven is to explore telling stories that matter. I mean. Portraiture, of course, is typically the story of the person, right? But how do we tell the story of that person um, who means something to us? For example, this particular photo, I'm going to deconstruct the one we've already seen. It, I mean, Yosemite, it's a sunrise, it's a bride, and it's one of our dearest and closest family friends. So who she is really matters. And I know her story. I know how she's helped out one of my daughters. We had a tragedy in our town, and one of my daughter's good friends died in that tragedy. And this person here, Claire, was a big help to her. So she, this is an important person, right? And so I want to tell that story. I want to create something in my vision, my specific goal, which is authentic. And we've already seen where that's going. So it starts out before sunrise. And she's getting ready with her sister and my daughter into her wedding dress. And I'm just standing out there like, okay, what am I feeling right now? What, what's in the air? And that's a really important first step in portraiture is to tune into yourself. You know, we all know how important mindfulness now is and meditation, these different things. And mindfulness is just a way to say like, okay, how does the chair feel underneath me right now? And where am I? And just sort of locate yourself. And then who is the person that I'm photographing? And how do I convey that inner and invisible truth? This is a person who's strong, who's brave, who's bold, who's beautiful. How do I tell that story? And there's different ways to tell that story. And so what I'm exploring how to do is, is capture that in different ways. And we're kind of seeing a little bit of a sequence. In this case, there's sort of three subjects and she's there, smaller person in a bigger landscape. And in this case, it's more expansive. This story, um, we're gonna see that she's looking sort of away from the mountain and Half Dome there is almost looking away from her. And while I think this is beautiful and I think this is really a singular photo because there's two main subjects, I don't necessarily like it because of the look away. Um, it's not wasn't my favorite moment. I am lining her shoulders up on the horizon line, as you can see there as well, head slightly above it. And then this one, when I finally moved, and I just moved maybe three or four feet to my right and started to kind of arrange myself in this scene, I was like, okay, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, and this is it. But there was a, there was a problem with this photograph, which is, I'm thinking of myself as a dad of three daughters and Half Dome over there is, is kind of like the father and it's almost like the father and then there's the younger, the daughter who's gonna be married and I'm thinking more of like my emotion and I was thinking of like, man, I can't, I don't know how I'm gonna be when my daughters get married and I have to see them off. But this photo isn't about me, it's about her. And so, yes, there's some nice cadence, there's these three elements, but the trouble is the horizon line. She's below it. And if she's this beautiful, bold, brave bride, I need her above that. And I need her to be almost on equal footing with Half Dome. So it's like, you know, this big presence of this mountain, yes, but it's also more about her than it is about the mountain. And so that story only comes from 
the meaning that you can see that I had inside of me, right? So if I just said, well, I'm going to go photograph someone in a wedding dress, doesn't even matter who out at this point, maybe it'll be a good picture. And maybe I'll just try and I love this lens. I'll just try that. That it's not going to, it's not going to end up very well, right? You might get lucky, but what you want to do is tell these meaningful stories. Number eight, keep in mind as you're shooting that everyone literally is a perfect portrait subject. And I just have one image and one little mini story on this. I was on assignment and I was photographing in San Francisco for San Francisco ballet. And while I was waiting, this guy was walking by and I started a conversation with him. We were just drawn to him. And I asked him what his interests were because you know my conversational thing. And he said, well, I love writing. And suddenly, I could see myself in this guy. And this guy was a writer without a home. He he was a homeless person, but rather than seeing him as that, that type, rather than typecasting, rather than putting him in that box, I was seeing the humanity. And what we want to do in portraiture is look at someone so deeply that we begin to see ourselves. And I've written seven books. I've never been homeless, but I do know what it's like to feel like you're, you don't belong. And so that connection, I think, was made. And, and it was an honor to capture that picture. As we're shooting subjects, we are really a mirror to them. So they're reflecting our energy, they're reflecting our nonverbal behaviors, they're reflecting everything who we are. And so when there are pictures that we see that we like, we should see the photographer in them as well. Like you should be able to predict how I was standing, how I was moving, how I was talking. You should be able to predict that I was incredibly present and engaged. There's different levels of listening. Active listening is like you reflect back to the person when you say, how are they, you know, where'd you go today? And they say, I went to the store. And you say, oh, you went to the store. So that's active listening. But then deep listening is more than that. It's like your presence is involved. And so that's that mirroring which becomes so important. Tip number 10 here is that as we capture portraits, it provides this incredible occasion for wisdom. I think one of the main reasons I continue to capture portraits is I learned so much about how to live. In this case with Kelly Slater, he shared this idea with me. He said, you know, Chris, I'm embarrassed to admit that for most of my life, I confused the idea of Kelly Slater with the person of Kelly Slater. And it helped me just realize like in my own life, okay, there's these two different things, this version I project in the world and who I really am. And true identity is more than what we see on the outside and who I want to be is more aligned with that. Here's a poet, a young Pueblo captured in the street of New York. He has this one poem talking about creating versions of himself, depending on who was around. And so I'm gaining this wisdom poetically as well from him about, hey, Chris, be who you are. This is that baseball player um, and in the off season, he'll live on a really low budget and sleep in his van and do the van life thing. And it reminds me to stay hungry, to stay humble. It doesn't matter what you, you know, just because you maybe have money doesn't mean you should just spend it. Um, or these are some family photographs. My kids on the left, they remind me all the time to laugh, love, snuggle, play. Um, let me go back. The one in the middle. I love this one. The way the daughter here is leaning on her dad and just the importance of leaning on people that we care for. And then that kid on the right, just he was jumping around and just the importance of taking flight. These are mentors. Rodney Smith on the left. Stillness of hand can't make up for emptiness of heart. In other words, it doesn't matter. He was a film photographer no longer with us. Doesn't matter how still your hand is, how technically good you are. If your heart's empty, it's not going to lead to making great photographs. And then Linda Wyman, who founded Linda.com, who I worked with them for years and years, um, teaching on creating online tutorials, she would always tell me that teaching is kindness made real, that what we're doing as teachers isn't making people think we're great, but it's this service, it's this gift, it's this act of kindness. And other times, maybe it's just more literal. You photograph a painter and you say, you know what, I want to paint. Or you photograph a dancer, you say, I want to dance. I haven't danced in, in a long time. Or you're photographing a friend who's going on an adventure and he's like digging really deep. I just want to do something where I'm digging deep. Or you photograph a couple and they're just so vibrant and full of love. And just it makes you think like, okay, all of the all this stuff we're doing, really, it's all about love and care and kindness. And so if you can tune into that, it can sort of fuel your portraiture in a completely distinct and different way. And it can help you to accomplish really great, great photos. 
So that wraps up my 10 tips and then I'll do a couple kind of housekeeping slides. I have another b &H, uh, webinar coming up on posing. So if you if you are interested in posing, I'm going to spend an hour really talking about how to pose in a really simple and strong ways. If you just do a search for that, you'll find those details, but that's coming up here. Um, and that will look at kind of these before and afters and how we can bring a subject to a place where there there's a better pose there, like some of the ones we've talked about. I have this book. If you're interested in digging deeper into this, it's in print and audible form. Um, and I've gotten amazing feedback on that. So if something resonated here and you want to dig deeper, that could be a way to access that. I also have another workshop coming up in March um, where I do this in-person work if you're interested in, in joining for something along those. And you can just do a search for my name and that will allow you to find those so that you can capture portraits that are, have meaning, that have depth, that have narrative, that have story, that get beyond the surface. And that is the beauty of this craft and ultimately also teach you some wisdom. And the wisdom I think that this photo constantly is reminding me of is that one day I'm gonna need to let go of my daughters and I have three of them and that is just so hard. So in a way, this photograph is kind of preparing me for that moment so that I can see them off so they can almost take flight and, and go. So there you have it. Um, those are kind of the, um, those, those tips and there's uh, just my domain name if you want more info on that uh, workshop, you can find that there. And those are 10 hopefully meaningful fun tips for you to capture better portraits and that's that's the end of my slide deck, so I suppose we could go back. Um, let me just go ahead and stop screen sharing or maybe one of you guys can help me with that, or is that something I need to do here. Let me just see here one second. There we go now I can do that this way. And then I can open it up for a little bit of conversation. We're pretty good on time here, everyone. And um, Michael, if you have any thoughts or questions or we can field some others that have come in or- So was... many thoughts. Thank you so much for yeah. letting, letting us into that mindset. Um, we do have a couple questions. Before I get to them, there's so many great comments and everyone who's still there on YouTube, please add those last minute questions if you have them. Um, but we're getting great presentation, very relevant to me right now. I think that is probably the consensus across the board. We've got over a thousand viewers and they're, they're really relating. There was super refreshing. Somebody else mentioned, I've never heard a photographer talk, talk about the struggle of portrait photography versus just being that <laughs> professional. So you really let, let the audience into that yeah. mindset. Um, all right, so let's jump uh, in. Wait, can I go there yeah. real quick for a second? Yeah, go there, I, I think, take us I thought there. about it a lot because, um, you know, if a graphic designer can show a halfway done graphic, you know, logo, and it's kind of cool. Or my mom's a painter, halfway done painting is amazing. But a halfway done portrait is just so horrible. Like I, I was photographing this yoga teacher and she was really nervous. Um, and she just gave this just horrible expression. I can never share the photograph because she would be too embarrassed. But but I think the reason why I wanted to bring that up is um, and my, my dog's trying to get into my little cabin here. Well, hopefully that won't be distracting. But the reason why I wanted to bring that up is that when that happens, to not let it derail you, but rather to realize game on. This is the moment. And it's kind of like if you look at a lot of sports and different events, let's say like um, I have a good friend who's a kayaker, the bigger the river and water and waterfall, he's like game on or I, I enjoy surfing, you know, when there's big swells, yes, or let's say snowboarding when there's big snow and there's amazing powder, let's go. So rather than shying away from that and fearing that or or letting it reflect back to us like I'm not any good. Just say like, no, this is like, this is an indicator to flip the switch to do the work and and that that's kind of what makes it also so satisfying, you know, is that it, it isn't easy, you know, and and it's not like shooting ducks in a barrel or whatever the, the analogy is. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm glad the glad people picked up on that. Um, and it keeps us humble. There's no guarantee. There's never ever a guarantee with portraiture. That's why it will always be valuable because people change situations change time passes and every photo shoot I ever do I always have a I'm always a little bit nervous because you never know like I captured a portrait of you I love that portrait of you on the street that one time but I, I wanted it to honor you as how who how I see you and all this stuff but you never know I mean you just don't know if it will work or not and so that's that's kind of the beauty of it.
Um, I love that photo you took of me and I'm super <laughs> grateful for it. And, you know, we, we met on so many other occasions and I was always like, mm -hmm. you know, why didn't you take a picture of me on this trip? When I saw you at the photo <laughs> and I'm like, all right, well, I was available. Why didn't you take a picture of me there? But the lesson that you taught me without even saying it was that you took the photo that was meant to be, that you intended yes. to shoot, that yes. I was ready without even knowing to shoot. So I love that. And I really love that photo and all the yeah. imagery you shared in the presentation with all those friends and acquaintances and even, even the strangers that you turned into acquaintances. So many good yeah. lessons there. So yeah. I want to jump into a question. There's a lot of question about lighting, um, natural light, flash, yeah. fill. Um, let us into your mindset there. Yeah, first and foremost, I come from kind of a perspective that the this will sound a little um, out there for some people, but just cut me some slack for a second. But I love the the term namaste. I practice yoga. I'm a yogi. And at the end of class, they say namaste, which means the light in me honors the light in you or the light in me sees the light in you. So first and foremost, it's internal light. That's all that's all that matters. I mean, like I shoot with pro photo and I, I can talk about lighting and teach lighting and do all that. And I, I'll comment on that. But if you have the most, let's say, high-end light and, ref and great hand-painted backdrop and everything perfect, if you're not seeing someone's internal something, essence, soul, heart, mind, if you don't like those words, just say personality. If you're not seeing their personality, for my aim in portraiture, I, I, I feel like I've lost. I haven't, it hasn't achieved what I've wanted to. So that first it goes back to getting specific. What do you want to achieve? Then it look, goes to searching for what that is you're looking for and then saying, okay, now how do I use light to accomplish that? I think people usually begin the other way around. They're like, this light's really cool. Someone stand there. <laughs> you know, And it's like, well, that's like a pretty well lit photo, but I don't feel anything. And it's almost like, my daughter got an electric guitar for Christmas. It's like, it's loud, it's in tune and it's strong, but it's like not a song, right? And it's like, she has an amazing Fender Stratocaster guitar, a cool amp and all that. So I think with that, it's going back to some of that other stuff I said. Then afterwards, it's exploring how do you want to shoot or like, or how do you want to go camping? Are you more of like a small backpack person or are you a big backpack or are you like, you know, going with your friends and three assistants or, and do you have the space to do that? Like the RV is really expensive. Like studio space in my town is really expensive. Um, so kind of asking yourself those questions and then lighting wise, if for natural light, if you need a key, it's basically put someone in darkness facing the light. So find a shadow and then have them turn towards the light. And that's how I get all the light in the eyes. 90% of the time bulk my, my whole career is almost built on that concept. And the trick with that is how deep they are in the shadow. So if we're in a garage and they're in the garage opening or doorway opening, there's that one Ben Moon shot I was talking about. He was like six inches inside of the door, which darkened his cheeks just enough because that doorway's here. If he were three feet in it, it would have been a completely different picture. It wouldn't have been as illuminated here and in his eyes. So figuring out how close the, the subject is to the edge of the shadow. That's the second little tip on that one. Then I also like light that bounces and reflects around and those kind of things. And there's a lot of other nuance to that or backlight and those kind of things as well. So that's maybe my little mini tip on natural light. Studio light, I mean, the beauty of shooting mirrorless is that it's, it's ridiculously easy. So I shoot um, the cameras I mentioned and then I'll shoot pro photo. And there's ways to be able to, you know, you set your exposure and there's plenty of tutorials out there. One that comes to mind, um, uh, Miguel Quiles. I mean, if you just Google him, you could find it really quickly. Um, but you you can set it up so you have a good exposure using something called TTL. So basically the, the flash is helping you figure out how much light. And then you modify it a little more or a little less. So it becomes really intuitive. So if you're wrestling with using external lights, figure out what path you want to take. So here's, here's what I mean. Hopefully this is helpful, Michael, <laughs> but I'm kind of an intuitive guy. So I like to trust my gut. So I figure out how to light based on that. Now that drives some people crazy. I'm like the guy who like walks up to a piano and doesn't read music, but plays, plays a song. And they're like, I don't even know. I don't, you know, but that's my path. I figured that out. Other people, like to be very meticulous, read music, you know, like they know every little thing. They have the light meter, they have that. 
And if that's you, if you're more of an engineer's mind in that way, then take that path. It's not that one's better or worse, except that it's better or worse to us, right? And would you agree with that as a photographer? Because you found your own path, like the way you shoot. Certainly, certainly. Yeah. yeah. So those are a couple thoughts. I don't know if that helps or not, but. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. So a couple other questions about lenses. Um, you know, you quickly yeah. talked yeah. about which lenses you shoot. Someone was asking about a 70 to 200 zoom lens versus yeah. an 85. Um, yeah. And then another question on the same level was uh, somebody asking about shooting portraiture close up, maybe using a wide camera, relying on crop. So, um, you know, yeah. what, what gear is on your camera? What's yeah. your go-to? Um, yeah. And if it changes, what is, what, you know, why are you changing to a zoom lens? What kind of situation? Right. Yeah. And those are really fun questions and, and kind of rewinding a little bit. My, the biggest tip I think I could share with that is to get a lens and really get to know its personality rather than getting a bunch of lenses and being confused. So, so what I, what I mean by that is let's just go with like a 24 to 70. It's a pretty mid range lens. It's a pretty kind of functional. It's not too wide. It's not too zoom, you know, can kind of do everything. In that way and so that's lens I'll, i use that a lot because it with one camera and one lens i can get like more of an establishing scene shot environmental portrait and it does that in a really nice natural way no distortion looks beautiful the wider you go more you have to think about your camera height and proximity to your subject so just being careful thinking about that and then when you get to those focal lengths you know that are a little more up close like the 50 or the 85 or the 70 to 200 a lot of that for me depends upon the look the feeling the vibe i want to create but also the proximity to the subject and the subject's comfort level with the lens some subjects if you pull out because i have the 70 to 200 i love that lens if you pull out that lens one i have to scoot way far away from my subject so i'm kind of i have to talk a little bit louder to connect and then the subject can get a little nervous because it's a big lens so I find if I want to create a really intimate, connected, authentic portrait, I'm going to reach more for the 85. If I want something really like heroic, like that bride photo in Yosemite, and that one too for me is the first wedding photo photograph I think I've taken that I liked. Um, I mean, I've, and you know what I mean by that? Like I've liked a lot of the photographs I've taken, but that's like that, I'll call that my favorite one. And because I think it's hard, wedding photography is really, really hard because it's so obvious, like the clothing and the situation and the moment. So to create something that transcends that genre of photography is, is hard, but that you need a 7200 for the compression for the scene and for all of that, you know, to really have that reach and that look and that feeling. Um, so, so in there, so this isn't a very clear answer, but maybe, um, 85 is one that like if I only had two lenses, it would be 24 to 70 in the 85. And the bulk of the work that I showed there was captured with those two. So if you saw an up close portrait in my slide deck, that was with the 85. If you saw one more environmental, that was most likely with the 24 to 70. And I think the part about getting to know those the lenses that you use, whatever they are, is to get to know them and to really move move your feet, move your camera height, and explore how that lens likes to convey and see and capture the world. Wider angle lenses, they're a little bit, they're hungry. They kind of like, oh, look at all this stuff, like why there's so much happening right here. And they can kind of drift because of that. So you need to find a way to anchor them the scene. So like in traditional landscape photography, shoot wide and have something in the foreground that's close to the camera. And so like with the van shot, the guy leaning on the van, that's probably at a 24. So I'm getting lower, whatever is closest to the lens is the biggest thing. So he's kind of, like, kind of looks taller than the van almost. He isn't, but then the van tapers off because it's further away. And so I know with that wider angle lens, I need to do that, um, that kind of movement with my body um, where I'm standing, how, how, what the camera height is and all of that. And the fun thing about gear is that um, it just gives you this ability to express and to tell stories in so many different ways and also to be mindful of your subjects. Some subjects you want to have a small little 
camera setup. I, I'll, I'll shoot with the Sony a7C. It's a little teeny camera, full frame. I love that camera and that setup and small lens and people won't be intimidated by it. So again, it just, it really depends on, on the moment, but that's, those are a few, few thoughts. I think that pretty much wraps up our questions. But of course, there were so many other comments. I definitely wanted to mention a few. We yeah. had somebody jump in who said that you were a website developer teacher at Brooks back in the day and you rocked as a teacher. You also rock as a photographer. Uh -huh. um, yes, I God. saw another one. Um, somebody just said they wrapped up your last uh, um, Authentic Portraits workshop um, this month um, and they, that it's a great workshop and everyone should check out the next one happening in March. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And yes. so many additional thank yous and mind blown emojis. Um, everyone really, really enjoyed. What a way to kick off Depth of Field. So thank Ooh. you so much, Chris. Here we go. So excited. So excited to tune into the rest of them and um, grateful to Sony and grateful to B&H for, for this particular webinar and all that you guys do. Love you guys. Love everything about B&H and so, so happy to be part of the community. It's a, uh, it is really a deep, you know, talk, I mean, talking about the educational arm of what you all do, I mean, it really is this extension of kindness to us. You know, you bring us all these amazing people. And so um, I'm always learning from it. So I'm grateful, grateful to be in the mix, too. So, Hey, OK, Th this webinar, by the way, is uh, has been recorded. So if anyone wants to watch it again, if you yeah. missed anything, there was a lot of wisdom being dropped there. Uh, this is now you can rewatch it on YouTube on the webinar uh, section of our website. We also have a, a button you can click to open it up. So that'll be fully available. And uh, and I, I, I did know everything that Michael said, Chris, you're, you're amazing. And it was really great to have you at that depth of field in person a couple of years ago. Uh, we'll be we'll be thinking about you during this one. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, everybody, you can, uh, you'll can you be getting to keep an eye on those emails. We're going to do another, e another webinar next Tuesday of next week, Wednesday, and I think Thursday. We're doing three next week. So it's pretty, it's pretty busy. You jump on the website to see that schedule. And I uh, also just want to share, you know, Chris, it's so cool that you're in the cabin. You know, Michael and I were here. We're in the heart of New York City, right? The, yeah. the e and offices. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to connect in, in different parts of the world. Uh, yeah. Cool. So thank you so much. And thank you for Sony as well for sponsoring Chris. And Chris, we'll see you again in the next time. And have a great one. Thank you so much. Okay. Awesome. See you guys. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.